Hey guys, welcome back. TJ here with Dead History, and welcome to part two of our next presidential series installment, taking a look at the 40th president of the United States, Ronald Reagan. I am flying solo for the audio here. Uh, part one, of course, we took at the uh, take, took a look at the childhood, birthplace, and early education, and political rise, and acting career, and all that good stuff of Ronald Reagan. And in part two, of course, we're going to take a look at his presidency, uh, his legacy, and then his death and burial site. Uh, again, uh, one of the only burial sites I have not been to, one of only two. So uh, keep that in mind. We'll be seeing some stock photos from that. Um, uh, I am going to jump right in here. Now, of course, as I like to do uh, with all of these part twos, is I like to usually start off with the presidential election. And we're going to start off with the 1980 presidential election, the year I was born. Uh, that presidential election was Ronald Reagan uh, from California. He was the Republican. His running mate was George H.W. Bush. And then, of course, Jimmy Carter was the incumbent president, the Democrat. And his running mate was Walter Mondale. There was an independent candidate. His name was John B. Anderson. Uh, from Illinois. Uh, his running mate was a man by the name of Patrick Lucy. Now, uh, this was a landslide victory for Reagan. Uh, Reagan, the electoral vote was 489 for Reagan, 49 for Carter, and zero for John B. Anderson. Uh, the states carried was 44 states for Reagan, only six plus Washington, D.C. for Jimmy Carter. Uh, the popular vote was over 43, almost 44 million people voted for Reagan, and only 35 million voted for Carter. It was actually a 50.7 percentage uh, for Reagan and only a 41 percent for uh, for Carter. So it was a landslide victory for Reagan. He won handedly. He won easily. I'm sure you're seeing the maps. And maybe some campaign posters and all that good stuff that I usually show. Uh, so there you go. The 1980 election in which Ronald Reagan won the presidency and then became the 40th president of the United States of America. And now we're going to jump right into his presidency. Uh, going to give you a synopsis, an overview of his presidency. Then we'll do some fun facts. And then, of course, we will read... From the President is Dead by Louis Bacone, that wonderful, tremendous book that I read from every week regarding the President's death. So, here we go. Let's uh, start off with a little Reagan presidency. In the 1980 presidential election, incumbent President Jimmy Carter had little chance against a master of media, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan knew far less about policy on almost any topic than Jimmy Carter did. But Jimmy Carter made Americans feel sort of bad or guilty or discouraged about their country. Whereas Ronald Reagan made them feel good about their country. Reagan understood that the key to politics, as in acting, was to convey sincerity. To communicate the same small group of ideas over and over again until the audience accepted them. Jimmy Carter lost decisively, taking just six dates to Reagan's 44. But rejection did not stop him from working to free the hostages up to the final moments of his presidency. That's Jimmy Carter, of course, with the Iranian hostage crisis. When he went to Ronald Reagan's inauguration, on January 20th of 1981, Jimmy Carter had not slept in over 50 hours. He was in the Oval Office that entire time trying to bring the hostages home. The Iranians wanted their pound of flesh. They wanted a final humiliation of the president. And so literally an hour or so went by quite deliberately until the news came that the hostages had in fact left that they were free, which, of course, launched the Reagan presidency on a pretty high note. The new president would have his hands full 
as he took office, but armed with a media savvy unrivaled since JFK. He would preside over a power shift away from Congress and back to the executive mansion. 1981, shortly after his inauguration, Ronald Reagan ordered a portrait of notoriously reserved President Calvin Coolidge to be hung in the cabinet room. After capturing 44 states in a landslide over Jimmy Carter, the 40th president was making a statement that conservatism had returned to the White House. The 69-year-old former actor would soon be dubbed the Great Communicator. He spent a lifetime before he entered the political arena in front of live audiences, radio microphones, and television cameras. He knew how to speak. He knew how to convey emotion. He knew how to convey authenticity. When a candidate tries to be something that he is not, the American people can see through that quite quickly. And so they have to be comfortable in their own skin. That was one of the traits that Ronald Reagan had in abundance. Reagan's conservative message promised a balanced budget through cuts in taxes and government spending, but increased funding for defense. You know, I think that in terms of what Reagan brings to the presidency is a commitment to a specific ideological agenda that had been absent since Lyndon Johnson. The Reagan belief is that the power of the presidency should be used across the board to create a more conservative society. But after his first month in office, Reagan's pursuit of a conservative agenda was stalled by a House of Representatives controlled by Democrats. It took an attempted assassination to strengthen his hand. The Reagan legend is born on March 30th with the attempted assassination of the president by John Hinckley.
And above all, by Reagan's reaction, he gets rushed to the hospital. He is on the operating table, and he asks the doctors if they are Republicans. We see this great light moment happen in the wake of what could have been a tragedy. And I think that it allowed Americans to rebound from that as well. As he recovered from a punctured lung, Ronald Reagan's approval rating jumped 14 points to 73%. The outpouring of public support gave him the leverage he needed. People forget that his tax bill was stalled in Congress at the moment that John Hinckley fired several bullets at Reagan. His popularity bounced up considerably, and that helped him get his bill through Congress. Reagan's management style mimicked his confident and optimistic personality. You know, they would sit in these meetings where one cabinet officer was arguing one thing and another would be arguing the other. And somebody had to win and somebody had to lose. But people would come out of those meetings with President Reagan. Everybody would feel good because of the way that the president handled it. He knew that when you are dealing with an opposition, you ask for a lot, and you negotiated, and you made it sound like you were never going to compromise, and at the last minute, you gave in, and you compromised, and you took 50% of what you asked for, and you claimed total victory. And Ronald Reagan had this ability to compromise at the last minute and claim total victory. By 1983, Ronald Reagan was in full-fledged pursuit of his other goal, reestablishing American power abroad, which he felt had been in decline for much of the previous decade. Reagan was a big-picture guy. He wanted America's pride restored. He wanted to strike detent, detent with the Soviet Union, or detente, I should say. Reagan came to office convinced the United States was losing the Cold War. We had fallen behind the Soviet Union, so his answer was to dramatically increase the amount of money we are spending for the military. Reagan reignited the use of proxy wars to challenge the Soviet Union. He ignored the War Powers Act established in the wake of Vietnam to limit a president's ability to wage war without congressional oversight. He ordered an attack on the tiny island nation of Grenada and got American troops involved in a Lebanese civil war. Reagan does everything he can to confront the Soviet Union. He calls it the evil empire. He oversees a massive military buildup. Reagan is determined to confront the Soviets directly or indirectly wherever he can. But the proxy war approach would come back to haunt the president when it was revealed his administration had been breaking the law by secretly funding Nicaraguan, Nicaraguan rebels fight against a communist regime with money siphoned 
from the sale of illegal weapons to Iran. The Iran-Contra scandal eventually leads to hearings in Congress. What is interesting about the hearings is that the Democrats claim that Iran-Contra is a constitutional crisis. The Republicans in Congress stress that the real danger to the United States is an imperiled presidency that will not have the strength or ability to defend national security. For a long time, presidents had a very, very tough time admitting mistakes. They will use the passive voice. Ronald Reagan, mistakes were made in Iran-Contra. Not, I made mistakes. And I do not think that always sits very well with the American public. No direct evidence was ever found linking the president to the decision to swap missiles for money. Still, Reagan issued a formal apology in March of 1987. My fellow Americans, I have spoken to you from this historic office on many occasions and about many things. The power of the presidency is often thought to reside within this Oval Office. Yet it doesn't rest here. It rests in you, the American people, and in your trust. Your trust is what gives a president his powers of leadership and his personal strength. And it's what I want to talk to you about this evening. For the past three months, I've been silent on the revelations about Iran. And you must have been thinking, well, why doesn't he tell us what's happening? Why doesn't he just speak to us as he has in the past when we've faced troubles or tragedies? Others of you, I guess, were thinking, what's he doing hiding out in the White House? Well, the reason I haven't spoken to you before now is this. You deserve the truth, and as frustrating as the waiting has been, I felt it was improper to come to you with sketchy reports or possibly even erroneous statements, which would then have to be corrected, creating even more doubt and confusion. There's been enough of that. I've paid a price for my silence in terms of your trust and confidence, but I've had to wait, as you have, for the complete story. That's why I appointed Ambassador David Abshire as my special counselor to help get out the thousands of documents to the various investigations. And I appointed a special review board, the Tower Board, which took on the chore of pulling the truth together from me and getting to the bottom of things. It has now issued its findings. I'm often accused of being an optimist, and it's true. I had to hunt pretty hard to find any good news in the board's report. As you know, it's well stocked with criticisms, which I'll discuss in a moment, but I was very relieved to read this sentence. The board is convinced that the president does indeed want the full story to be told. And that will continue to be my pledge to you as the other investigations go forward. I want to thank the members of the panel, former Senator John Tower, former Secretary of State Edmund Muskie, and former National Security Advisor Brent Scowcroft. They have done the nation, as well as me personally, a great service by submitting a report of such integrity and depth. They have my genuine and enduring gratitude. I've studied the board's report. Its findings are honest, convincing, and highly critical, and I accept them. Tonight, I want to share with you my thoughts on these findings and report to you on the actions I'm taking to implement the board's recommendations. First, let me say I take full responsibility for my own actions and for those of my administration. As angry as I may be about activities undertaken without my knowledge, I am still accountable for those activities. As disappointed as I may be in some who serve me, I am still the one who must answer to the American people for this behavior. And as personally distasteful as I find secret bank accounts and diverted funds, as the Navy would say, this happened on my watch. Let's start with the part that is the most controversial. A few months ago, I told the American people I did not trade arms for hostages. My heart and my best intentions still tell me that's true, but the facts and the evidence tell me it is not. As the Tower Board reported, what began as a strategic opening to Iran deteriorated in its implementation into trading arms for hostages. This runs counter to my own beliefs, to administration policy, and to the original strategy we had in mind. There are reasons why it happened, but no excuses. It was a mistake. 
I undertook the original Iran initiative in order to develop relations with those who might assume leadership in a post-Khomeini government. It's clear from the board's report, however, that I let my personal concern for the hostages spill over into the geopolitical strategy of reaching out to Iran. I asked so many questions about the hostages' welfare that I didn't ask enough about the specifics of the total Iran plan. Let me say to the hostage families, we have not given up. We never will. And I promise you we'll use every legitimate means to free your loved ones from captivity. But I must also caution that those Americans who freely remain in such dangerous areas must know that they're responsible for their own safety. Now, another major aspect of the board's finding regards the transfer of funds to the Nicaraguan Contras. The Tower Board wasn't able to find out what happened to this money. So the facts here will be left to the continuing investigations of the court-appointed independent counsel and the two congressional investigating committees. I'm confident the truth will come out about this matter as well. As I told the Tower Board, I didn't know about any diversion of funds to the Contras, but as president, I cannot escape responsibility. Much has been said about my management style, a style that's worked successfully for me during eight years as governor of California and for most of my presidency. The way I work is to identify the problem, find the right individuals to do the job, and then let them go to it. I found this invariably brings out the best in people. They seem to rise to their full capability. And in the long run, you get more done. When it came to managing the NSC staff, let's face it, my style didn't match its previous track record. I've already begun correcting this. As a start, yesterday I met with the entire professional staff of the National Security Council. I defined for them the values I want to guide the national security policies of this country. I told them that I wanted a policy that was as justifiable and understandable in public as it was in secret. I wanted a policy that reflected the will of the Congress as well as of the White House. And I told them that there will be no more freelancing by individuals when it comes to our national security. You heard a lot about the staff of the National Security Council in recent months. Well, I can tell you they are good and dedicated government employees who put in long hours for the nation's benefit. They are eager and anxious to serve their country. One thing still upsetting me, however, is that no one kept proper records of meetings or decisions. This led to my failure to recollect whether I approved an armed shipment before or after the fact. I did approve it. I just can't say specifically when. But rest assured, there's plenty of record keeping now going on at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. For nearly a week now, I've been studying the board's report. I want the American people to know that this wrenching ordeal of recent months has not been in vain. I endorse every one of the Tower Board's recommendations. In fact, I'm going beyond its recommendations so as to put the House in even better order. I'm taking action in three basic areas, personnel, national security policy, and the process for making sure that the system works. First, personnel. I've brought in an accomplished and highly respected new team here at the White House. They bring new blood, new energy, and new credibility and experience. Former Senator Howard Baker, my new chief of staff, possesses a breadth of legislative and foreign affairs skills that's impossible to match. I'm hopeful that his experience as minority and majority leader of the Senate can help us forge a new partnership with the Congress, especially on foreign and national security policies. I'm genuinely honored that he's given up his own presidential aspirations to serve the country as my chief of staff. Frank Carlucci, my new national security advisor, is respected for his experience in government and trusted for his judgment and counsel. Under him, the NSC staff is being rebuilt with proper management discipline. Already, almost half the NSC professional staff is comprised of new people. Yesterday, I nominated William Webster, a man of sterling reputation, to be director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Mr. Webster has served as director of the FBI and as a U.S. District Court judge. He understands the meaning of rule of law. So that his knowledge of national security matters can be available to me on a continuing basis, I will also appoint 
John Tower to serve as a member of my Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board. I am considering other changes in personnel, and I'll move more furniture as I see fit in the weeks and months ahead. Second, in the area of national security policy, I have ordered the NSC to begin a comprehensive review of all covert operations. I have also directed that any covert activity be in support of clear policy objectives and in compliance with American values. I expect a covert policy that if Americans saw it on the front page of their newspaper, they'd say, that makes sense. I have had issued a directive prohibiting the NSC staff itself from undertaking covert operations. No ifs, ands, or buts. I have asked Vice President Bush to reconvene his task force on terrorism to review our terrorist policy in light of the events that have occurred. Third, in terms of the process of reaching national security decisions, I am adopting in total the Tower Report's model of how the NSC process and staff should work. I am directing Mr. Carlucci to take the necessary steps to make that happen. He will report back to me on further reforms that might be needed. I've created the post of NSC legal advisor to assure a greater sensitivity to matters of law. I am also determined to make the congressional oversight process work. Proper procedures for consultation with the Congress will be followed not only in letter, but in spirit. Before the end of March, I will report to the Congress on all the steps I've taken in line with the Tower Board's conclusion. Now, what should happen when you make a mistake is this. You take your knocks, you learn your lessons, and then you move on. That's the healthiest way to deal with a problem. This in no way diminishes the importance of the other continuing investigation. But the business of our country and our people must proceed. I've gotten this message from Republicans and Democrats in Congress, from allies around the world, and if we're reading the signals right, even from the Soviets. And of course, I've heard the message from you, the American people. You know, by the time you reach my age, you've made plenty of mistakes. And if you've lived your life properly, so you learn. You put things in perspective. You pull your energies together. You change. You go forward. My fellow Americans, I have a great deal that I want to accomplish with you and for you over the next two years. And the Lord willing, that's exactly what I intend to do. Good night, and God bless you. His poll numbers rose because he took responsibility. The public had forgiven him. This set the stage for Reagan's greatest foreign policy triumph, ushering in the peaceful end of the Cold War. Of course, every president since Truman deserves a little bit of credit for the fact that we won the Cold War. Ronald Reagan is the one, though, that came in and rebuilt our defenses. His campaign slogan was, Peace Through Strength. He knew how to end the Cold War in a way that meant it was going to end with a whimper and not with a bang. His ultimate luck was to be confronted with a radically different kind of Soviet leader in Mikhail Gorbachev. Someone who understood the need for change. Radical change. In May of 1988, his last year in office, Reagan visited the Soviet Union, signaling that the end of the Cold War was finally in sight. I think Reagan's unique contribution, oddly enough, is that the man who came to office in 1980 complaining against government, saying government was the source of our problems and not the solution, he actually restored faith in government. And he also restored faith in the office of the presidency. Ronald Reagan gave America hope again that he appeared as part Franklin Roosevelt, part Dwight D. Eisenhower, with a little bit of TR thrown into it. As one person said, it was the role of his life, and he played it perfectly. He made it almost impossible for any president to follow him. And there you go, a little synopsis overview of Ronald Reagan and his presidency. 
Uh, now I'm going to read you uh, some fun facts. I'm actually going to read you about the assassination attempt on Reagan. I'm going to read you a little bit of another story uh, regarding the assassination attempt. Then I'm going to read you about the 1984 presidential election where Reagan got late reelected. And then we'll get into some fun facts uh, surrounding Reagan. So uh, here we go. So now regarding the assassination attempt uh, on Reagan's life, it was actually March 30th of 1981. Uh, Ronald Reagan was shot and wounded by John Hinckley Jr. It was in Washington, D.C. Uh, Reagan was returning to his limousine after a speaking engagement at the Washington Hilton Hotel. Um, and yes, of course, the story goes that John Hinckley believed that the attack would impress actress Jodie Foster with whom he had become obsessed with. Um, so the Hilton, the uh, Washington Hilton Hotel is still there. Uh, it still stands to this day. Um, I, uh, I did visit that. You are going to see that in the, um, in the uh, bonus footage. Uh, and ironically enough, and kind of crazy enough, um, I... Didn't know this. This actually happened ironically. Um, if I can find the pictures right now when I'm talking about it, I'll show it. Uh, my brother lives in Texas. Uh, and he. I was down there visiting last year in Texas. And um, I visited uh, University Park, Texas, right outside of Dallas. Uh, there's a high school called Highland Park High School. Uh, it's actually the high school of anybody who's a sports fan. Uh, Dodgers pitcher Clayton Kershaw. And former Lions quarterback Matthew Stafford both went to high school there. As a matter of fact, they were actually football teammates together. So I went to go see that high school just to kind of see where they both went to high school. And as I was researching the high school, I learned that John Hinckley Jr. actually went to high school there as well at Highland Park High School. So uh, I've actually been to the high school that Hinckley attended. Uh, and like I said, I have gone to the... Uh, Washington Hilton to see where the assassination attempt took place uh, and you'll see that in bonus footage so there you go uh, that's kind of you know what happened obviously he was okay uh, Reagan he did have surgery he was okay uh, he did survive uh, did uh, suffer a punctured lung from the incident um, so now also regarding the assassination attempt there's actually an interesting story uh, regarding Alexander Haig. Uh, anybody that doesn't know who Alexander Haig is, uh, he was a part of Reagan's cabinet. He was actually Ronald Reagan's Secretary of State. And uh, when the assassination took place, um, there was a, a very silly uh, thing that Haig did. Uh, he had, a during a press conference at the White House... Uh, Alexander Haig uh, stated to the press, I'm in control here. Um, why, he was referring to uh, he was in control at the White House while Vice President George H.W. Bush, Bush was actually returning to Washington from Fort Worth, Texas at the time. So Haig said, I'm in control here uh, at the White House, which is totally false. Uh, obviously, the control immediately goes to in a situation like this, based upon the 25th Amendment, of course, um, it goes to the vice president of the United States. And then if the vice president actually is not capable of taking over, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm almost 100 percent positive. It goes to the Speaker of the House um, actually takes over. Uh, the secretary of state is not even third in line. So um he definitely misspoke and made a very foolish comment, Alexander Haig did. Um, and it actually, I mean, he had a pretty long political career. Um, it actually was like the one thing that Alexander Haig is most well known for is making that very foolish comment, uh, you know, that he was in control here when Reagan uh, was hospitalized during the assassination attempt. Uh, now, interesting enough, um, you know, he allegedly suggested this erroneously. Um, so, be yeah. So, I, actually, I just looked it up. It is the Speaker of the House is designated the second in line of succession after the Vice President. So, obviously, you know, he just totally misspoke. 
But that's what he's remembered for. And the reason I'm telling you about this story is not only was Alexander Haig Ronald Reagan's Secretary of State, uh, he made that foolish comment, but in the bonus footage at the end of this video, you're actually going to see me visit the gravesite of Alexander Haig. Yes, uh, I did visit the gravesite of Alexander Haig. He died back in 2010, and he is buried at Arlington National Cemetery in Arlington, Virginia. So I'll show you his gravesite in this bonus footage, and I thought it was a nice little fun tie-in, little Reagan tie-in. So wanted to preface that for you guys. So you're going to see the Hilton, the Washington Hilton Hotel in bonus footage, and you will also see Alexander Haig's gravesite. So stay tuned for all that. And yeah, there are absolutely no alert measures that are necessary at this time or contemplate. Uh, now, if you have some questions, I'd be happy to Crisis take them. Crisis management, that's what it's put into effect when Crisis management is in effect. Who is making the decisions for the government right now? Who's making the decisions? Constitutionally, gentlemen, you have the president, the vice president, and the secretary of state in that order. And should the president decide he wants to tr transfer the helm, to the vice president, he, he will do so. As of now, I am in control here in the White House, pending return of the vice president, and in, in close touch with him. If something came up, I would check with him, of course. Now, moving on, uh, some more things about Ronald Reagan. What can I tell you here? Um, okay, how about this? Before we go any further, let's take a look at the 1984 election. Um, that is when Reagan got reelected. Uh, this was a destruction landslide of epic proportions. Um, in 1984, the presidential election, it was Ronald Reagan, who was the incumbent president, Republican, uh, versus the Democrat, Walter Mondale. Uh, Mondale's running mate was actually a woman, Geraldine Ferraro, uh, and Mondale got destroyed. I mean, literally destroyed. Uh, to the tune of 525 electoral votes for Reagan to 13 for Mondale. Ronald Reagan carried 49 states. Mondale carried one and Washington, D.C. It was 58.8% of the popular vote went to Ronald Reagan. I mean, it was a destruction of epic proportions. Um, the biggest landslide election of all time. Uh, it really was that that overwhelming. So Ronald Reagan won easily. Uh, I'm, of course, I'm sure you're seeing some of the maps of that. Uh, maybe some pictures of them campaigning and posters and that sort of thing. So that was the 1984 presidential election when Reagan was reelected. Uh, it was just, yeah, it, it was it was definitely uh, not pretty. Uh, for for uh, for Walter Mondale at all. So there's that. Uh, now, let's see. What are some other things I can tell you about Reagan before we move into some fun facts? So just a little bit more about uh, Reagan's presidency. Uh, the domestic agenda on the domestic front, Ronald Reagan implemented policies to reduce the federal government's reach into the daily lives and pocketbooks of Americans including tax cuts intended to spur growth, known, of course, as Reaganomics, as it was so famously known as. He also advocated for increases in military spending, reductions in certain social programs, and measures to deregulate business. Uh, by 1983, the nation's economy had started to recover and enter a period of prosperity that would extend through the rest of Reagan's presidency. Critics maintain that his policies led to budget deficits and a more significant na national debt. Some also held that his economic programs favored the rich. Uh, in 1981, Reagan made history by appointing Sandra Day O'Connor as the first woman to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, in foreign affairs, Ronald Reagan's first term in office was marked by a massive buildup of U.S. weapons and troops, as well as an escalation of the Cold War with the Soviet Union which the president dubbed the evil empire. Key to his administration's foreign policy initiatives was the Reagan Doctrine, under which America provided aid to anti-communist movements in Africa, 
Asia, and Latin America. In 1983, Ronald Reagan announced the Strategic Defense Initiative, a plan to develop space-based weapons to protect America from attacks by Soviet nuclear missiles. Also on the foreign affairs front, Reagan sent 800 U.S. Marines to Lebanon as part of an international peacekeeping force after Israel invaded that nation in June of 1982. In October of 1983, suicide bombers attacked the Marine barracks in Beirut, killing 241 Americans. That same month, Ronald Reagan ordered U.S. forces to lead an invasion of Grenada, an island in the Caribbean, after Marxist rebels overthrew the government. In addition to the problems in Lebanon and Grenada, the Reagan administration had to deal with an ongoing contentious relationship between the United States and Libyan leader Muammar al-Gaddafi. <clears throat> Gaddafi was uh, somebody that obviously is very well known in the 80s. During his second term in office, Ronald Reagan forged a diplomatic relationship with the reform-minded Mikhail Gorbachev, who became leader of the Soviet Union in 1985. In 1987, the Americans and Soviets signed a historic agreement to eliminate intermediate-range nuclear missiles. That same year, Reagan spoke at Germany's Berlin Wall, a symbol of communism, and famously challenged Gorbachev to tear it down. 29 months later, Gorbachev allowed the people of Berlin to dismantle the wall. After leaving the White House, Reagan returned to Germany in September of 1990, just weeks before Germany was officially reunified and took several symbolic swings with a hammer at a remaining chunk of a wall. Uh, that's the so famous uh, speech uh, and thing that Reagan said where he says, you know, Mr. President, tear down this wall. Um, so that was something uh, regarding the Berlin Wall uh, with Ronald Reagan, which you actually will um, see here, uh, right here in this clip. The advance of human liberty can only strengthen the cause of world peace. There is one sign the Soviets can make that would be unmistakable, that would advance dramatically the cause of freedom and peace. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. So there you have it. Another thing I did want to mention, um, in our opening, I did misspeak when I said that Reagan was president when the Berlin Wall came down. That actually was George H.W. Bush who was president when the Berlin Wall came down, because that was November of 1989. So it was actually George Herbert Walker, Walker Bush who was president at the time when the wall actually technically came down. However, Reagan was very instrumental in the wall coming down. Um, so, and of course, like I, we just saw him, just went over, he had that very famous, you know, Mr. President, tear down this wall, uh, you know, saying in speech. So um, I did want to just correct that. Um, make sure that you guys know that, you know, I, I did misspeak there uh, regarding that. All right. Now, some fun facts uh, before we get into the death of Ronald Reagan. So uh, he loved writing letters. Uh, Reagan carved out time in his day to both read and answer letters. And he was not discriminating about where they came from. A seventh grader once wrote to the president asking for federal assistance because his mother declared his bedroom a disaster area. Tickled by the kid's sense of humor, 
Reagan responded and suggested he clean the room. In 1984, Ronald Reagan wrote a letter of support to entertainer Michael Jackson, who had been badly burned during the shooting of a Pepsi commercial. You have gained quite a number of fans along the road since I want you back, and Nancy and I are among them. Pretty cool stuff. <clears throat> he loved jelly beans. He actually received free jelly beans for years. Uh, Ronald Reagan uh, first began snacking on jelly beans in 1966 after he gave up pipe smoking. Uh, Golitz or Golitz candy, which made his preferred jelly bean, sent him shipments while Reagan was holding office as governor of California from 1967 to 1975. After debuting the Jelly Belly line in the 1960s, the company continued to ship their goods to the White House during all eight years of Reagan's presidency. They even received permission to issue jelly bean jars with the official presidential seal to be given out at functions. Pretty cool stuff. Another thing, uh, you know, on the front of the jelly beans, he really did enjoy them. According to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library, his favorite flavor was licorice. And Ronald Reagan started eating jelly beans in 1967 as he was trying to quit a pipe smoking habit. He switched to jelly bellies a decade later. Uh, pretty cool stuff. I always love that. That You know, he really did love it. Um, many are familiar with the Ronald Reagan jelly bean story. If not, it goes a little like this. Ronald Reagan had a pipe smoking habit. And though he felt the activity was okay for an actor, he thought it was a poor reflection on a politician. In order to kick the smoking habit, he started eating jelly beans. Contrary to popular belief, he was not a big fan of jelly beans. <clears throat> Regarding the old school jellies available, he preferred licorice. This got him through his gubernatorial duties in California. And when he was elected president of the United States, he discovered, discovered a new brand of jelly beans, Jelly Belly. This changed Ronald's tune about the beans, and the Jelly Belly company sent tons of jelly beans to the White House over the years. There are many shots of White House meetings that include containers of jelly beans. So, pretty fun stuff. Jelly bean lover. Uh, Ronald Reagan helped to destigmatize hearing aids. In 1983, Ronald Reagan admitted he relied on the use of a hearing aid in order to address age related hearing loss. Previously, hearing aids had been stigmatized in the United States as representing a feeble constitution. After Reagan's announcement, Sales of hearing aid equipment soared. Starkey Laboratories, which made the president's device, quadrupled its sales in the months following the publicity. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, there have been at least 10 statues erected in his honor. Reagan's hometown of Dixon, Illinois, has no shortage of tributes to their most famous resident. A statue of Reagan stands near his boyhood home, while a second, this one depicting Reagan on horseback, is near Rock River. Reagan has also, all, has also had statues erected in his honor at the California Capitol, at Reagan National Airport in Arlington, and in Newport Beach. There are two in Budapest, one in London, and one in Warsaw. The largest to date, a 10-foot tall monument of Reagan saluting, stands in Covington, Louisiana. Yet another is planned near Lowell Park in Dixon, where Reagan reportedly saved 77 lives while serving as a lifeguard there for seven summers. A local joke has it that some of them were women who faked distress in order to get his attention. <laughs> Pretty cool stuff. And you're actually going to see uh, a couple of those statues in the bonus footage. So stay tuned for that. I did visit some of the Reagan statues. Here's kind of a funny thing, uh, or maybe not so funny. Uh, Will Ferrell, the famous comedian... He upset the Reagan family. Following Ronald Reagan's death in 2004 from pneumonia, the Reagan estate was quick to cut down any suggestion that his longtime struggle with Alzheimer's disease affected his role while in office. In 2016, his children, Michael Reagan and Patty Davis, chastised actor Will Ferrell for considering a comedy titled Reagan in which he would play a neuro neurologically afflicted president whose behavior leads to alternative takes on world history. The Alzheimer's Association said in a statement it was appalled by the idea. Will Ferrell quickly distanced himself from the film, which has yet to be made. Pretty interesting. Didn't know that. 
while I was researching. <clears throat> Let me see what else I can tell you here. Oh, one food that Ronald Reagan did not like was Brussels sprouts. This is according to the Reagan Library website. In her autobiography, Nancy Reagan said her husband was not a fussy eater since he traveled on the public speaking circuit for decades. But he also did not like tomatoes. Uh, pretty, pretty funny stuff. Uh, we know this. I just touched on this. Future president lost partial hearing in one ear when he was heard on a movie set in the late 1930s after a gun was fired next to his ear. Decades later, President Reagan wrote to Michael Jackson offering his support after Jackson was burned filming a TV commercial. So he could kind of relate to that, of course. Um, what else here? Oh, yep, we touched on this. Ronald Reagan was the first person ever elected as president to have been divorced. He had married actress Jane Wyman in the 1940s, and the couple divorced in 1948. He married actress Nancy Davis in 1952. Donald Trump is the second president to have had a divorce prior to his election. Um, so there you go there. Some more fun, fun, interesting facts. Uh, we did the jelly bean thing. Uh, unabashedly romantic. In 2000, the late Nancy Reagan published a memoir entitled I Love You, Ronnie, which included the letters from President Reagan to his wife, Nancy. President Reagan was adored by many of his supporters, and his candor was one of his greatest strengths as a government official. However, nobody knew him like Nancy. Her decision to publish many of the letters he had written to her painted him in an exceptionally romantic life. He once boasted to his wife on Valentine's Day that other people who were stuck only enjoying on a specific day were of the ordinary variety. He claimed to live a Valentine's life. Oh, Ron, what a softy. The two individuals who met while focused on careers as actors would go on to become the first couple of California and then the United States. The romantic Ronald Reagan. He was exceptionally generous. Continuing on the soft heart of President Ronald Reagan, Nancy presented the public with more insight during his waning years. While serving in executive offices, the former governor of California and president of the United States would receive hundreds of letters from constituents. You can imagine the boatload of letters that would arrive at the White House daily. Nancy joked that Ronald was a notorious check writer, and this was because he would write personal checks to individuals who would write him about their personal financial struggles. And these weren't necessarily checks for a week's worth of groceries. He was known to drop $4,000 or $5,000 checks into the mail for certain people. He was also known to call upon the Air Force to aid in the transport of children who were experiencing medical emergencies. Pretty interesting. The success of Bedtime for Bonzo. Have you ever seen Bedtime for Bonzo? Sweet mercy, what a romp. What it is, is a, about a live action film that stars a primate. They always seem to sell well at the box office and carve out a niche in the cult classic category. Bedtime for Bonzo fits the bill. The film became even more popular 29 years after its 1951 release when Ronald Reagan was elected president of the United States and it holds up pretty well in the 21st century. The gem of this mid-century release was the ideology environment has more to do with behavior than hereditary. Uh, within the film, Ronald plays Professor Peter Boyd, an anthropologist hopeful to prove his environmental influence theory carries significant weight. Reagan passed on the sequel, Bonzo Goes to College, because he didn't find it believable. Because Bonzo goes to college and joins a football team. <laughs> Oh, pretty funny. Uh, Ronald Reagan would have traded everything to play baseball. Ronald Reagan was a big baseball lover, and he did everything in his power to shine the spotlight on the sport as America's pastime. He even dedicated May of 1983 as National Amateur Baseball Month. This was an effort to get kids out onto the diamond, and it worked. Baseball enjoyed a spike in popularity, and the baseball card trade climbed toward the peak of its popularity. Ronald Reagan joked that he loved the game of baseball so much he'd enjoy it if a stray ball came flying through the window of the Oval Office. 
We imagine that would have given him an excuse to slip outside and get involved in the game. If you are curious as to which team he pledged his baseball allegiance, it was the Chicago Cubs. This means that the former president, born in 1911, was born three years after the Cubs' last World Series victory until, obviously, a few years ago when the Cubs won again. Ronald Reagan never saw that. One of Ronald Reagan's most memorable movie roles came in the 1940 football-based drama Newt Rockne, All-American. In the film, former president Reagan played legendary Notre Dame football player George the Gipper Gip. The real George Gip was the university's first Walter Camp All-American and Notre Dame's second consensus All-American. George contracted pneumonia and died in 1920 at the age of 25, his final year at the university. In Newt Rockne, All-American, Ronald Reagan made a well-known George Gipp deathbed speech legendary. This was the speech in which George Gipp asked Rock to deliver a message to the boys the next time they were really struggling in a game to just win just one for the Gipper. Reagan adopted the nickname after his portrayal and used the phrase win one for the Gipper during his 1980 campaign for presidency. George, this telegram just arrived from Walter Camp. You've been named fullback on his All-American team. You would kid me, Rock. No, it's on the level. You're gonna be all right, kid. I haven't got a complaint in the world, Rock. I'm not afraid. What's tough about this? Someday when the team's up against it, the brakes are beating the boys. Ask them to go in there with all they've got. Win just one for the Kipper. I don't know where I'll be then, but I'll know about it. And I'll be happy. He made friends with everyone, even squirrels. The list is quickly building up Ronald Reagan to be a total saint. And to a certain extent, he was. However, we will get to some darker legacy momentarily. Until then, another aww moment. President Reagan loved spending time on the White House lawn. And to the, to the local Washington, D.C. squirrel population, he became known as a true benefactor. President Reagan loved feeding the squirrels to the point where they'd come near. The squirrels became quite tame. This lasted until the end of his presidency when George H.W. Bush won the 1988 election and moved into the White House in 1989. When Reagan departed, he knew the Bushes would be bringing their dog to the White House. So he left a farewell note to the squirrels. Beware of the dog. George H.W. Bush joked about this while eulogizing his former president. Uh, thanks for the GPS. Could you imagine life without easy access to GPS? It has changed everything. Anyone who's called a major metropolitan area like Los Angeles or New York home understands how much more efficient life is with the use of GPS. Before that, it was lugging around the epic Thomas Guide map. It looks genius level intelligence to figure those things. Ultimately, we all have Ronald Reagan to thank for the civilian use of global position systems. It was after the Korean Airlines Flight 007 tragedy that Reagan announced plans to offer the technology to civilians when it was more refined. At the time, GPS was reserved for military use. In 1983, the president offered the use of GPS to civilians through an executive order. No, we are never crazy about the use of that power in the U.S. of A., but all things considered, it was a good flex of the executive office. Pretty interesting. I didn't know that at all. Officially retired from acting, unlike another former governor of California, 
Ronald Reagan had no desire to continue acting after he became interested and involved in politics. Maybe it started with his service as the president of the Screen Actors Guild. Once he tossed his name in the hat for the gubernatorial duties of California and developed a campaign, he said farewell to acting. Many thought he would serve his term as governor, then slide back into the pursuit of roles in film and television. But Governor Reagan had other ideas. This was wholly intentional, as he turned down roles during his time as governor, and even as president and after his presidency. He felt a return to his former career as an actor and entertainer would diminish his accomplishments in the office of governor and president, and he preferred to be considered a political figure for the rest of his life. Interesting stuff. <clears throat> um, let me see here. Tear down the wall. It is rather mind-boggling to consider the throes of history and know we're, we are only 75 years beyond the rise, rule, and fall of Adolf Hitler. No thanks to his d disillusion, the world was thrown into upheaval. One result of Hitler's idiocy was the division of Germany. A surrendered treaty agreement offered to Russia following their undesired involvement in World War II. It did not take more than a decade before the division of Germany and the Berlin Wall seemed like a terrible idea. Regardless of how some people may feel about walls, there has never been a wall that has not been conquered. <clears throat> the influence of the United States continued to flourish during the following decades, and when Ronald Reagan took office, he began to spit some powerful rhetoric, tear down the wall. George H.W. Bush continued to use these words till the wall fell in 1989. The Soviet Union fell soon thereafter. Interesting. Uh, Ronald Reagan had a dark side. As mentioned, Ronald Reagan had a legacy that was darker than most Republican supporters would want you to recall. A few things immediately come to mind. The 1980s war on drugs and Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign seemed to be an exercise in futility and an exercise in how to leave minorities with their pants down in public. Hindsight has offered a glimpse at some shady dealings between the highest ranking American officials and the drug trade in Central and South America. Before his presidency, Reagan was part of the Hollywood roundup known as blacklisting while serving as the president of the Screen Actors Guild. When it came to the civil rights issues of the 1950s and 1960s, Ronald Reagan was often in support of keeping races divided, even if by not offering support legislation support offering support legislation the civil rights act of 1964 ronald reagan was outspoken against it um yeah so uh ronald reagan not only the war on drugs which was a disaster um he also the uh the aids epidemic um ronald reagan terribly did a terrible job with aids uh aids was obviously something that was new uh, back in the early 80s, uh, this was something that was taking the world by storm, this terrible disease known as AIDS and HIV. Um, and Ronald Reagan, he practically just ignored it. He shunned it. Um, he thought it was just going to be a problem in certain sectors or certain communities, so to speak. And uh, he really didn't want, didn't think much of it. Uh, so he definitely dropped the ball on the AIDS epi epidemic uh, as well. Uh, the Electoral College loved him. To this day, Ronald Reagan sits alone in the United States presidential election history for taking home the most electoral votes in the history of any election. His campaign for re-election in 1984 proved to be an embarrassment for the Democratic Party, which offered Walter Mondale as its candidate. The 1984 election was a decimation, a beatdown, the final count, Reagan 525, Mondale 13. The Electoral College loved Ronald Reagan. If you are not a United States citizen and don't understand how the Electoral College works, don't fret. 99% of Americans don't really understand it either. That stated, here's one of the cool things about those chosen in good faith to serve as the electors. In 1976, one elector went rogue and voted for Ronald Reagan in the 1976 presidential election even though he was not running. This is known as a faithless elector. Pretty interesting stuff. Uh, some last things. 
We know that only president to have been divorced. Voice of the Chicago Cubs. He easily won the presidency in 1980 and 1984. We went over that. He was shot two months after taking office. Uh, Reaganomics. Uh, Reagan became president during a time of double-digit inflation. Attempts to increase interest rates to help combat this only led to higher unemployment and recession. Reagan and his economic advisors adopted a policy named Reaganomics, which was basically supply-side economics. Tax cuts were created to spur spending, which would and did lead to more jobs. Inflation went down, and so did unemployment rates. On the flip side, huge budget deficits were incurred. Uh, he was president during the Iran-Contra scandal. Uh, he presided over a term of glasnost at the end of the Cold War. One of the key events of Reagan's presidency was the relationship between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Reagan built a relationship with Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev, who instituted glasnost, or a new spirit of openness. During the 1980s, Soviet-controlled countries began claiming their independence. And on November 9th of 1989, the Berlin Wall fell. All of this would lead to the downfall of the Soviet Union during President George H.W. Bush, his term in office. And last but not least, before we get into the death, Ronald Reagan suffered from Alzheimer's disease after the presidency. After Reagan's second term in office, he retired to his ranch. And in 1994... Reagan announced that he had Alzheimer's disease and he left public life. On January 5th of 2004, Reagan died of pneumonia. And that leads us right up to, of course, the reading from the wonderful book, The President is Dead by Louis Bacone. We go over this every week. This is a phenomenal book. Go out and buy it. You will not be disappointed. It is incredible. Love it. So, we are going to read now about the death and burial site and such of Ronald Wilson Reagan, our 40th president of the United States, reading directly from The President is Dead by Louis Bacone. Shortly after Ronald Reagan had taken office, he was the victim of an assassination attempt by John Hinckley Jr. that left him with a bullet wound to the chest. This brush with death on March 30th of 1981 forced him to consider his funeral plans. He asked Vice President George H.W. Bush and British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher to deliver eulogies at his funeral, and a team was assembled to plan it. At first, they met about twice a year, and later, Nancy Reagan became more heavily involved. The final instructions totaled 300 pages, and in the end, the team was very happy with the way the events played out. After his presidency, Ronald Reagan moved to Bel Air in Los Angeles, where he focused on writing his autobiography, An American Life. Over the next few years, his public appearances diminished, and on November 4th of 1994, Ronald Reagan released a handwritten letter to the country. He announced he was suffering from Alzheimer's disease, which had deteriorated his memory and would bring about dementia. For a while after this sad announcement, he continued to golf and go to his office. When he was no longer capable of those activities, he remained at home, secluded from the public. By the end of the decade, he no longer remembered that he had been President of the United States, although for a while he knew that he was someone important. He could still recall the early years of his life in rich detail, such as when he worked as a lifeguard in Illinois. By 2002, Reagan, at the age of 91, had lived longer than any other president, surpassing John Adams' age of 90 years and 247 days. In the late spring of 2004, Ronald Reagan developed pneumonia. By this time, he had ceased speaking. His final words went unrecorded, but most likely they were unintelligible. His daughter, Patty, wrote that before he fell silent, the sound of his voice filled the room sometimes, not with words, but maybe they, they were words to him. For weeks, he lay in a bed in his former home office, which had been converted into his bedroom. He was barely able to move, and his breathing grew weaker. On June 1st, he closed his eyes 
and his family sat on a death watch. On Saturday, June 5th, he was surrounded by his wife, Nancy, his children, Patty and Ronald Jr., his doctor, and an Irish nurse. As Nancy spoke to him, he suddenly opened his eyes for the first time in four days. Ronald Reagan gazed straight into her eyes one last time. He fell back on his pillow, and he died at 1 p.m. on June 5th of 2004. President George W. Bush was in France for the 60th anniversary of D-Day and made a statement from the ambassador's residence in Paris. This is a sad hour in the life of America. A great American life has come to an end. Ronald Reagan won America's respect with his greatness and won its love with his goodness. He had the confidence that comes with conviction, the strength that comes with character, the grace that comes with humility, and the humor that comes with wisdom. He leaves behind a nation he restored and a world he helped save. During the years of President Reagan, America laid to rest an era of division and self-doubt. And because of his leadership, the world laid to rest an era of fear and tyranny. Now in laying our leader to rest, we say thank you. He always, he always told us that for America, the best was yet to come. We comfort ourselves in the knowledge that this is true for him too. His work is done and now a shining city awaits him. May God bless Ronald Reagan. Every former president spoke of the loss. From Plains, Georgia, Jimmy Carter called it a sad day for our country. He spoke of Reagan's gift for reaching the American people. <clears throat> From George H.W. Bush, uh, you know, made uh, comments. And even from the other side of the political aisle, former B President Bill Clinton said Hillary and I will always remember President Ronald Reagan for the ways he personified <clears throat> optimism of the American people and for keeping America at the forefront of the fight for freedom for people everywhere. His body was taken to Gates Kingsley and Gates Funeral Home in Santa Monica, California, where 25 satellite news trucks were already waiting for the arrival. <clears throat> Due to the likelihood that Reagan would die at home, the funeral home had been notified of the role a year earlier, but this was kept secret even from much of the staff. On Monday morning, June 7th, an honor guard carried the 700 masterpiece model mahogany casket outside and placed it on the rollers in the funeral hearse. <clears throat> They closed the door and they drove 40 miles to Reagan's presidential library in Simi Valley. Pockets of people gathered along the route. Some carried signs, one of which read, God bless the Gipper. It arrived at 11 a.m. and a Marine band struck up hail to the chief. So there was service after it concluded. Um, let me see here. People even left uh, jelly beans, obviously. Uh, Wednesday, June 9th, the remains were taken to the Naval Base Air Force and placed in a blue and white Boeing 747 bound for Washington, D.C. Obviously, there was a ceremony and a uh, public viewing and such in Washington, D.C. Uh, and then, obviously, it was transported back to California um, to the Presidential Library uh, there where... Ronald Reagan is laid to rest. <clears throat> um, now, a little bit about the death sites. Uh, his home, where he lived in Bel Air, where Reagan died, was built in 1954. It was a simple home and one of the most modest in the neighborhood. Uh, so, on Dece actually, the original address was 666 St. Cloud. But given the ominous associations with that number, the Reagans petitioned to have the address changed to 668. On December 23rd of 1988, former President Reagan visited the home for the first time. Pulling up in the driveway, he commented to his aide, I'm awed and I love it. He spent the next nine nights there, becoming familiar with the house that he would retire to a month later. The home is located at 668 St. Cloud Road in Los Angeles, California. It is a private residence and not open to the public. Uh, you might be seeing some outside shots of uh, 
you know, shots I found online. And then, of course, the gravesite is on the grounds of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library and Center for Public Affairs. Uh, the library was originally to be located on the campus of Stanford University, but it was moved to a barren area in Simi Valley because of objections from the local community. Uh, so over the next two years, Spanish Mission Style Museum, blah, 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 just talking about the building of it. Uh, the library itself is located at 40 Presidential Drive in Simi Valley, California. Uh, that is where President Ronald Reagan and First Lady Nancy Reagan are buried. Now, the pictures you're seeing here are pictures of Ronald Reagan's gravesite uh, and Nancy Reagan, First Lady Nancy Reagan's gravesite there at the Presidential Library in Simi Valley, California. I have not visited here, as you guys all know. It is one of only two president gravesites I have not seen, the two both in California, Nixon and Reagan. So all these pictures you're seeing are stock photos I found online. And pictures friends of mine who have been out there uh, have sent to me to use. So uh, there you go. Beautiful, supposedly, uh, and you'll see probably some photos here on the screen. Uh, the view from where his gravesite is is beautiful. The view of the valley is absolutely breathtaking from what I hear. Uh, so a very nice gravesite and final resting place for our 40th president of the United States, Ronald Reagan. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, you will have bonus footage. Uh, there will be footage of the Hilton, uh, Washington Hilton, where the assassination attempt took place, of Alexander Haig's gravesite, of some Ronald Reagan statues, all that sort of stuff. So stay tuned for some bonus footage. Uh, it's the most I could do, obviously, because a lot of stuff regarding Reagan is out in California. Uh, so stay tuned for some bonus footage. And I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope you enjoyed part two, a look at the life, legacy, presidency, uh, death, burial site of our 40th president, Ronald Reagan. Uh, and here we go, guys. We're down to it. Uh, we have one left. Next week, we will take a look at the 41st president of the United States, George H.W. Bush, the last of our presidential series, at least for now. So... Thanks so much for all the support, guys. Keep it coming. Keep those comments and questions coming. Please submit those questions for a question and answer session with us. Please, please, please. We love it. Anything you want to ask us, ask us anything. Does not even have to be history related. Whatever you guys want. Uh, and we will see you next week for our final installment of our presidential series. Thank you for everything. And we will see you next week. Bye, guys. Hey guys, TJ here with Dead History, and I am actually in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm actually at this really nice church shrine thing here. Um, kind of see it in the background. So the reason I'm here, let me flip you guys around, is for that. Right there. <laughs> that statue is Ronald Reagan <laughs> and Nancy Reagan. <clears throat> eating a plucky placky so basically the story goes there they are if let me see if i can read something here here we go that looks like it's in polish at the invitation of father prior uh let me see did, 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 on september 9th of 1984 the president of the united states ronald reagan was a guest at the polish american festival at Our Lady of whatever it is, Chesawa, Chesawa Shrine, which is where I'm at. Uh, he was accompanied by the festival chairwoman, Miss Jenny Kowati. Uh, shrine volunteers, uh, she was a shrine volunteer and longtime school teacher. The president enjoyed the delicious Polish potato pancakes and later addressed a crowd of 40,000 festival participants that is what that plaque says right there and that's i believe in polish the same thing so that's actually not nancy reagan i take that back that is actually the miss jenny kawe or kawe or gawe so there you go pretty cool right look at that it's got like a signature 
like you know in, in green there it's really cool <laughs> he's eating a potato pancake our 40th president of the United States Ronald Reagan uh, let me read this to you real quick we Americans who are not related to Poland by blood are related to her by spirit just as Polish immigrants decades ago bolstered America's resolve to live up to its ideals, so too a brave son of Poland now inspires all of mankind. The world is truly blessed that in this time of peril and confusion, spiritual leader of great historical significance is with us. We've sought his advice and guidance on numerous occasions, and I can only say, thank God for Pope John Paul II. Look at that. There you go. Just wanted to show you guys this. Cool little Ronald Reagan thing in uh, Doylestown, Pennsylvania. Thanks for joining, guys. Hey guys, how's it going? I'm actually at uh, the Ronald Reagan Airport. I gotta cross the street here so I don't get hit. Uh, let me flip you guys around. And there you go. It's good old Ron. So I wanted to show you guys this statue real quick at the uh, Ronald Reagan Airport here in DC. So there you go. Really nice statue of Ronald Reagan. Pretty cool stuff. Take some pictures for you guys, but there you go. Ronald Reagan statue at the Ronald Reagan Airport in Washington, D.C. Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History. And I am actually in Hamilton, New Jersey. Uh, it's down by Atlantic City, New Jersey, for anybody that's kind of familiar with Atlanta, uh, New Jersey. See right there, Ronald Reagan Drive. Let me turn you guys around. There you go, Ronald Reagan Drive. And right here, outside of this Wells Fargo, right here, this rock indicates where Ronald Reagan stood in 1984. There you go. So it says, Ronald Reagan, 40th President of the United States of America, honored the town of Hamilton by addressing the residents of this community in southern New Jersey from this site on September 19th of 1984. Hold on. Big truck going by, sorry. This plaque was presented to the town of Hamilton, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, supposedly, too, at this site, uh, Reagan stood here uh, on September 19th of 1984 uh, and he actually praised legendary New Jersey rock and roller Bruce Springsteen as well uh, so he during this little speech he made he gave uh, kudos to Bruce Springsteen as well so pretty cool stuff right here in Hamilton New Jersey nice little town like I said not far from uh, from Atlantic City and as you see, Ronald Reagan Drive up there, right where the rock is, basically. So, all right, guys, just wanted to show you this. Here in New Jersey, Ronald Reagan stood right here in 1984. I was four years old at the time <laughs> and living about, eh, probably about a little over an hour from here. 
at the time. So thanks guys. Hey guys, how's it going? So right here, that is the grave of Alexander Haig. Let me turn you around. So Alexander Haig, of course, is famously known for being the Secretary of State to Ronald Reagan. And in probably his biggest political moment, <clears throat> or at least most memorable political moment, Haig famously said that he was in control here uh, after Reagan was shot and the uh, failed assassination attempt on Reagan's life, Alexander Haig was Reagan's Secretary of State and he uh, told the press that he was in control here, uh, which he obviously was incorrect about. <laughs> it obviously goes to the Vice President and then the Speaker of the House, uh, not the Secretary of State as far as control and power. So, um, but anyway, yeah, so this is Alexander Haig's gravesite in Arlington National Cemetery here in Virginia. Just wanted to show you guys this. So, there you go. Pretty cool stuff. Thanks for joining, guys. Hey guys, TJ here, Dead History, and behind me, that plaque there. Uh, I'm gonna turn you guys around, actually. So what that is, is this is a plaque uh, signifying where John Hinckley actually shot Ronald Reagan on March 30th of 1981 uh, here at the Washington Hilton. That's what this big, huge building is here. Uh, so where actually Reagan came out, it's not here. Um, it's since that happened, that incident happened, they've made the walkway that he came out is now actually an underground garage. And I was actually just looking around a little bit. I would assume it's probably this garage like over here. So what's underneath me is probably, you know, what w w around where Reagan obviously walked out. So it's not this exact spot here, but I think it's this general location is where it was. Uh, that Reagan was shot. He was thrown into the limousine and then rushed uh, to the hospital where obviously, you know, surgery was performed and his life was saved and he was okay. Uh, but here you go. The uh, Hilton, the Washington Hilton here in Washington, D.C. Let me get a good shot. Let me make sure I'm not going to get run over. So there you go. Good stuff. Pretty cool stuff, and then there's the plaque over there, so very cool. Here's the Washington Hilton where Ronald Reagan was shot in 1981. Thanks for joining, guys.